So today we are going to have a discussion on a very basic uh, topic of ENT, which is the temporal bone anatomy. And this temporal bone anatomy knowledge is a must for any otologic surgeon. So to start with it, so temporal bone, it is pyramidal in shape and it forms part of the middle and the posterior cranial fossa. It articulates with the parietal bone, with the occipital bone, with the sphenoid and with the zygomatic bone. Embryologically, the temporal bone has four parts, the squamous portion, the petromastoid, the tympanic and the styloid process. The zygomatic process is a part of the squamous part of the temporal bone. So this is a dry temporal bone. This is what a temporal bone looks like. This is a squamous portion. This is a natural temporal bone, the squamous portion, the mastoid portion, the tympanic and the styloid, which is broken in this bone. The squamous part, it covers the temporal. This is a squamous part. It covers the temporal lobe of the brain. The zygomatic process, which is a part of the squamous process part, can be shaped, it can be traced posteriorly and it forms the supramastoid crest. So this supramastoid crest has a clinical significance. It marks the level of the middle cranial fossa dura. The squamous part, it extends inferiorly to form the lateral portion of the mastoid process. In addition, it also forms part of the superior part of the external auditory canal. The tympanic part of the temporal bone forms the anterior and the posterior parts of the external auditory canal. Inferiorly, it is expanded to form the vaginal process of the styloid process. It forms the posterior wall of the glenoid fossa. This is the glenoid fossa. It forms the posterior wall of the glenoid fossa. It interfaces with the petrous bone at the petrotympanic fissure. So I will show you the petrotympanic fissure. This is the petrotympanic fissure through which pass the cauda tympani, the anterior tympanic artery and the anterior ligament of malleus. There is a projection on the posterior superior aspect of the external artery canal, which is called the spine of Henle. This is the spine of Henle. And this marks the anterior limit of dissection in case of a canal wall up mastoidectomy. Laterally, the tympanic bone, it borders the cartilaginous external auditory canal, whereas medially, it bears the tympanic sulcus, which is deficient superiorly, and where the tympanic membrane attaches directly to the squamous portion. Coming on to the mastoid part, the mastoid part, because of the constant pull of the sternocleidomastoid and the digastric muscle, it grows inferiorly. The muscles attached to it are the sternocleidomastoid, the splenius capitis, the longismus capitis, and the digastric on the medial aspect. Here you will see, this is the digastric groove where the digastric muscle posterior belly is attached. Parallel to it is the groove for the occipital artery. Just anterior to the digastric groove is the stylomastoid foramen through which the facial nerve exits the temporal bone. This digastric groove forms a corresponding ridge which is a landmark. The anterior edge of the ridge is a landmark for the facial nerve. The mastoid process, it is rudimentary in neonates. It starts developing after one year of age as the sternocleidomastoid muscle develops and pulls on the bone. It completes development by two years. This is of surgical importance because when we make an incision in the post-oral groove in adults, it is one centimeter just behind the pinna. But in case of infants, we have to make a horizontal incision because there is no mastoid tip to protect the facial nerve. The mastoid antrum is an air-filled cavity. It is the most consistent and the largest air cell in the mastoid. It is well-developed at birth. Its approximate volume is about 2 ml. 
Its relations include medially lies the posterior semicircular canal, inferiorly is the endolymphatic duct and sac, posteriorly is the sigmoid sinus, and superiorly is the middle cranial fossa dura. The lateral wall in adults corresponds to the McEwan's triangle. The mastoid air cells, these are air filled cavities arising from the walls of the mastoid antrum. And there can be various mastoid air cells. They can be periantral, they can be sinodural, along the sigmoid sinus, which are called the perisinus, in the mastoid tip, which are the tip cells and behind the descending part of the facial nerve which are called the retrofacial cells. This can also extend up to the petrous apex and the zygomatic root. The mastoid it develops from the squamous as well as the petrous portions of the temporal bone. Sometimes this patent petr petrosquamous suture persists as a bony lamella. It is a bony lamina which and bony lamella plate and this is called the corner septum. So its persistence may lead to difficulty in locating the antrum leading to incomplete removal of disease. So this is the corner septum and the actual antrum lies beneath it. The McEwan's triangle is bounded superiorly by the supramastoid crest, posteriorly by a vertical tangent drawn along the posterior canal wall and the posterior superior portion of the external auditory canal. The mastoid antrum lies approximately 12 to 15 millimeters deep to this triangle. It is identified by the cribrose area which is pierced by numerous blood vessels. The supramastoid crest or which is also called the linea temporalis marks the level of the middle cranial fossa dura and also the lower border of the temporalis muscle. It is also the avascular plane where the horizontal T of the musculoperiosteal incision is made. Trotman's triangle, another triangle in relation to the mastoid antrum, which is bounded superiorly by the superior petrosal sinus, posteriorly by the sigmoid sinus, and anteriorly by the solid angle. The solid angle is an angle which is formed between the three semicircular canals. So here you see this is the sigmoid sinus, the superior petrosal sinus, this is the posterior semicircular canal and that is the triangle which is known as the Trotman's triangle. Clinically it is very important because it is a very thin area from which the infection from the mastoid can travel up to the posterior cranial fossa. And it is also an important landmark to reach the posterior cranial fossa from the mastoid antrum. Now coming on to the petrous bone. The petrous bone, the word petrous means rock-like. It is an extremely dense bone which guards the sensory organs of the inner ear. It projects in the anterior medial direction. It has three surfaces. It has a superior surface a posterior surface and an inferior surface and it has three borders. It has a base and an apex. The base lies laterally and it is formed by the superior semicircular canal, the vestibule, the cochlea and the carotid artery. The apex, it forms part of the foramen lacerum. The posterior surface, the landmarks on the posterior surface, this is the porous of the internal auditory canal. This is the impression of the groove for the superior petrosal sinus. This is the groove for the sigmoid sinus. This is the carotid foramen. It has an endolymphatic faucet and an operculum which covers the intraosseous part of the endolymphatic sac. Landmarks on the superior surface these include the, the arcuate eminence, which is very clearly seen here. This is the arcuate eminence, which is formed by the bulge of the superior semicircular canal. The facial hiatus, which is canal for the greater superficial petrosal nerve. 
this is another hiatus for the lesser petrosal nerve and the foramen spinosum the spinosum foramen through which passes the middle meningeal artery the petrous apex marks the transition of the intrapetrous to the intracranial internal carotid artery it also has the orifice of the eustachian tube bony eustachian tube and it has an impression for the trigeminal nerve in the meckel scape the inferior aspect of the petrous bone it is quite irregular because it has many grooves and foramina it has the jugular fossa which houses the jugular bulb it has the carotid foramen and between the jugular fossa and the carotid foramen is the jugulo carotico crest now this has a small foramina which transmits the jacobson's nerve that is the the jacobson's nerve and the inferior tympanic artery the clinical significance of jugulo carotid crest comes in case of glomus jugular tumors in which it gets eroded which is called the flep sign the inferior surface also has a cranial aperture of the cochlear aqueduct and a groove for the inferior petrosal sinus so this is on a magnified view of the inferior surface this is the portion which lodges the dome of the jugular bulb this is a groove for the auricular branch of the vagus this is the carotid foramen and this is the cochlear aperture the groove for the inferior petrosal sinus the clinical significance of the bone covering the dome of the jugular bulb is that it might be deficient in a few cases I think we have lost the connection. Please be online. Of the petro, uh, petrous uh, bone. So this shows the doom of the jugular bulb, the internal carotid artery foramen and the jugulo carotid crest. So this is the aperture for the uh, cochlear aqueduct. This is the inferior, the groove for the inferior petrosal sinus and this is the styloid process. The cochlear aqueduct it is a duct which connects the scalar tympani to the uh, subarachnoid space and it terminates just in front anterior medial to the jugular foramen so it is used as a guide for the lower limit of the internal artery canal dissection the styloid process the styloid process in greek means pillar it uh, has variable length uh, ranges from 2 to 3 uh, centimeters it gives attachment to three muscles and two ligaments. The three muscles are the stylohyoid muscle, the stylohyoid muscle, which is attached to the lesser corner of the hyoid bone, the styloglossus muscle, and the stylopharyngeus muscle. The two ligaments include the stylohyoid and the stylomandibular. So there is one um, a syndrome which is of clinical importance which is called the Eagles syndrome in relation to the styloid process. So in this the patient has pain in the ear 
uh, in the throat and the neck and which radiates to the ear and uh, it has been uh, the uh, the reason has been uh, incremented to the elongation of the styloid process or the calcification of the stylohyoid ligament now coming on to the tympanic membrane so the tympanic membrane it set set at an angle of 40, 55 degree to the external artery canal so which makes the anterior wall of the external artery canal longer than the posterior wall it has an epidermal a fibrous and a mucosal layer two portions the pars tensa and the pars flaccida the uh, fibrous layer of the lamina propria at the periphery it thickens to form a cartilaginous band which is known as the tympanic annulus and which fits into a bony sulcus which is called the tympanic sulcus the longest diameter from the posterior superior to the anterior inferior is 9 to 10 millimeters the past tensor as i've already uh, said that it has an epithelial mucosal and lamina propria layer the lamina propria of the past tensor it has a very definite arrangement of fibers it has outer middle and the inner layers and the fibers are arranged in a radial a parabolic and circular way but in case of past tensor these fibrous uh, fibers collagen fibers are arranged randomly that is why it is called the pars flaccida because of its flaccid nature superiorly there is deficiency of the tympanic sulcus and this area is called the notch of rivenous the coming to the blood and the nerve supply of the tympanic membrane there has there is a anastomosis in the lamina propria between vessels of the deep auricular artery coming from the external auditory canal and the anterior tympanic artery the stylomastoid and the posterior auricular artery coming from the mucosal aspect the nerve supply is the auricular temporal nerve the auricular branch of vagus and medially is the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve the tympanic cavity so the tympanic cavity has been traditionally divided into epitympanum mesotympanum and hypotympanum so this is what was the traditional division the epitympanum the mesotympanum and the hypotympanum so mesotympanum is that portion which is visible through the external auditory canal the epitympanum is that portion which lies above the anterior and the posterior malleolar folds the hypotympanum is the portion which lies below the level of the external auditory canal now since the advent of the endoscopic ear surgery two more divisions of the tympanic cavity have been added which is the retrotympanum and the protympanum the retrotympanum <clears throat> it is part of the mesotympanum and it includes the posterior and the posterior medial walls of the tympanic cavity <clears throat> the protympanum is anterior to the promontory and it is contiguous with the eustachian tube the roof of the tympanic cavity this roof is formed by the middle cranial fossa the middle cranial fossa dura which is separated by the tegmen the floor is formed by the pneumatized bone separating it from the jugular bulb occasionally the bone is dehiscent the bulb being covered only by fibrous and mucous membrane in approximately 5% at the junction of the floor and the medial wall of the cavity there is a small opening which is called the inferior tympanic canaliculus that allows entry of the glossopharyngeal branch of the uh, ninth nerve into the middle ear epitympanum <clears throat> epitympanum is that portion of the tympanic cavity which lies above the tympanic uh, branch of the facial nerve so that is the inferior boundary of the epitympanum it is bounded laterally by the scutum and medially by the superior and the lateral semicircular canals the geniculate ganglion it lies deep in the medial wall the contents of the attic include the malleus head of malleus the body of incus the short process of incus this is the short process of incus it occupies the aditus adjacent to the lateral semicircular canal
a bony projection which is called the cog. This is the cog. It divides the epitympanum into an anterior epitympanum and a posterior epitympanum. It is a very important landmark for the facial nerve because it points towards the facial nerve. The floor of the anterior attic contains the geniculate ganglion. The anterior wall of the tympanic cavity, the lower third of the anterior wall, it consists of a plate of bone covering the carotid artery. So this is the carotid artery. This is the tympanic cavity. The anterior lower one third, it is separated from the carotid artery by a very thin plate of bone, which may be 3 millimeters in thickness and which might be dehiscent in 2% cases. It is perforated by the superior and inferior carotico-tympanic nerves carrying sympathetic fibers to the tympanic plexus. The middle third has the tympanic orifice of the eustachian tube. Above it is the canal for the tensor tympani muscle. And the upper third is pneumatized, which is called the supratubal recess and which is separated from the anterior epitympanic space by the tensor fold. The medial wall of the tympanic cavity separates the middle ear from the inner ear. It has the promontory. This is the promontory which is formed by the bulge of the basal turn of the cochlea. It has the tympanic plexus. The oval window is an area with, where the footplate of this tapis is fixed with the annular ligament. It is kidney shaped and it con connects the middle ear with the scala vestibuli. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve runs immediately above it. The round window niche which obscures the round window membrane. The round window lies, at, lies perpendicular to the plane of the oval window. Its dimensions are 2.3 into 1.9 mm. The medial wall also has the processus cochlearyformis. It is located medial to the neck of the malleus and inferior to the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. The tensor tympani tendon, after coming from the canal of the tensor tympani, it takes a right turn and it attaches to the neck of the malleus. It is a landmark for the anterior aspect of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve which lies immediately superior to it. So this is the cochlearyform process. It's a very sturdy process which is not even destroyed by cholestoma. So it is a consistent landmark to identify the tympanic portion of the facial nerve. The posterior wall of the tympanic cavity, it has the aditus through which the middle ear communicates with the mastoid antrum. Below the aditus is a small depression where the short process of incus is lodged. Below the fossa incutus and medial to the opening of the cauda tympani nerve is a hollow conical projection which is called the pyramid which houses the stupidus muscle and the tendon. Now coming on to the retrotympanum. So retrotympanum is the posterior medial and the posterior wall of the middle ear cavity. It is divided into a superior retrotympanum and an inferior retrotympanum. Superior retrotympanum has the sinus tympani and the posterior sinus. The inferior has the sinus subtympanicus between the funiculus and the subiculum. To understand the anatomy of the retrotympanum, we need to know certain terms. These are the ponticulus. A ponticulus, what is a ponticulus? Ponticulus is a ridge of bone extending from the promontory to the pyramidal eminence, dividing the anterior space into the sinus tympani and the posterior tympanic sinus. Subiculum is a ridge of bone extending from the posterior lip of the round window niche to the posterior wall that is to the styloid eminence and it forms the inferior boundary of the sinus tympani. Another term is the funiculus. The funiculus is a ridge of bone inferiorly running between the basal helix of the cochlea 
and the bone of the jugular bulb and it marks the separation between the retrotympanum and the hypotympanum. The facial nerve, this is the facial nerve. The facial nerve, it divides the retrotympanum into the tympanic sinus medially and the facial recess laterally. The pyramid is the fulcrum of the retrotympanum. From the pyramid arises two structures, the ponticulus, which extends from the pyramidal eminence to the promontory, and a caudal ridge, a caudal ridge or a caudal crest, which extends outwards towards the caudal eminence. The caudal eminence is the portion where the cauda tympani nerve enters the tympanic cavity. So there are two ridges, one is the ponticulus, the other is the caudal ridge. The ponticulus divides the medial spaces into the or the anterior spaces into the sinus tympani and the posterior, uh, posterior sinus. The caudal ridge, it divides the lateral spaces into the facial recess and the lateral sinus. The facial recess is a very important area for the otologic surgeon. It is bounded laterally by the bony annulus or by the corotympani nerve and medially by the facial nerve. This is the area where a posterior tympanotomy is carried out for a cochlear implant surgery. Now sinus tympani has been classified. So the sinus tympani now we have learned lies between the ponticulus above and the subiculum below. So there is a classification of the sinus tympani based on its shape. It can be a classical uh, sinus tympani lying between the ponticulus above and the subiculum below. It could be confluent where there is no ponticulus. It could be partitioned where there is a ridge of bone which separates it into a superior and inferior sinus tympani and it could be restricted in case there is a very high jugular bulb and it restricts the sinus tympani. It can also be classified on the basis of depth. Type A is a small sinus tympani with no medial and posterior extensions to the facial nerve. A type B which has a medial extension to the facial nerve with no posterior extension and a type C is a deep sinus tympani which has medial as well as, as, well as posterior extensions to the facial nerve. The contents of the middle ear. The contents of the middle ear include the malleus. It has a head, a neck, an anterior process, lateral process and a long process. It is approximately 9 millimeters in length. The head lies in the attic, which is suspended by the superior ligament to the tegmen. It has a facet on its posterior surface for the incus. The tip corresponds to the umbo. The lateral process receives the attachment of the anterior and the posterior malleolar folds. This is of clinical significance. The lateral process, we should, not, uh, we should avoid touching it with burr while doing a canal plastic. The tendon of the tensor tympani muscle attaches to the deep medial surface of the upper part of the handle. The corda tympani nerve crosses medial or to the handle of malleus. The anterior ligament of malleus arises from the anterior process to insert into the petrotympanic fissure and along with the posterior incudal ligament creates the axis of the ossicular rotation. The incus it has a body, a short process, a long process and a lenticular process. The short process lodges in the fossa incudis by the posterior incudal ligament. The long process, it projects in the tympanic cavity and it is susceptible to osteotic reabsorption because of its delicate blood supply. The lenticular process is also sometimes called the fourth ossicle, maybe because of the incomplete fusion with the long process. The body of the incus is suspended by the superior incudal ligament that is attached to the tegment. The smallest of the ossicle, the stapes, which is shaped like a stirrup, it has a head, it has a neck, an anterior crust, a posterior crust and a footplate. 
the anterior crust is less it is thinner and it is less curved as compared to the posterior crust it is lodged in the oval window by the annular ligament the average dimension of the foot plate is 3 into 1.4 mm and the long axis is horizontal with the posterior end being lower than the anterior end two very important muscles of the middle ear the stapedius muscle and the tensor tympani muscle the stapedius muscle it arises from the walls of the cavity within the pyramid the tendon emerges at the apex of the pyramid and it attaches to the neck of the malleus it is supplied by the facial nerve the tensor tympani it arises from the walls of the bony canal lying above the eustachian tube at the process of cochlear formis it takes a turn and attaches to the neck of the malleus this is supplied by the mandibular nerve and both these muscles they act together to reduce transmission of sound to the inner ear Chordal tympani nerve it's a branch of the facial nerve which arises approximately 6 mm above the stylomastoid foramen and it enters the tympanic cavity at the posterior canaliculus runs across the tympanic membrane medial to the uh, malleus and leads to the petro tympanic fissure the chordal tympani nerve can be injured during middle ear surgery and which can lead to taste disturbances in approximately 15 to 22% cases the eustachian tube it is approximately 36 mm in length the lateral portion is bony arising from the anterior wall of the middle ear the medial two third is cartilaginous which opens at the posterior end of the inferior turbinate and there is a thin plate of bone which separates it from the tensor tympani muscle the carotid canal lies medially and it can impinge on the bony eustachian tube the bony labyrinth or the inner ear so the bony labyrinth includes the three semicircular canals the vestibule and the cochlea the three semicircular canals they include one horizontal canal and two vertical canals the all the three canals they lie at uh, right angles to each other and both the uh, all the three canals have an ampullated and a non ampullated end all the three canals are in relation to some part of the facial nerve the superior semicircular canal ampulla lies in close relation with the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve the ampulla of the lateral semicircular canal lies in close relation to the tympanic portion of the facial nerve and the posterior semicircular canal ampulla lies in close relation to the mastoid portion of the facial nerve the superior semicircular canal forms the arcuate eminence on the superior aspect of the petrous part of the temporal bone all the three canals they open into the vestibule by five openings the non ampullated ends of the superior and the posterior canals they join together to form the crest commune and which opens through a single opening in the vestibule the vestibule is a central chamber <clears throat> within the bony labyrinth in the petrous bone it has depressions on its medial wall for the utricle for the saccule and for the cochlear aqueduct now in this diagram you can see it lies medial to the oval window it lies posterior to the cochlea and lateral to the fundus of the internal auditory meatus the superior vestibular nerve fibers pass through a cribrose area to the ampullae of the superior and the lateral canal which is called the mikey's dot and they correspond to the lateral aspect of the internal auditory meatus now coming on to the cochlea the cochlea it is a spirally coiled tube with 2.5 turns in front lying in front of the vestibule it has a wide base and a narrow apex the basal turn it forms the bulge of the promontory now this cochlea it curls around a central bony core of bone which is called the modulus so it can be likened to a screw so this can be taken as a modulus and the coils of cochlea are winding around it so so that is the modulus and the turns of the cochlea are all around it so this modulus it arises from the fundus of the internal auditory canal and it carries this is the modulus this is the modulus and it carries the fibers of the cochlear nerve a shelf like bony projection 
arises from the modiolus which is called the bony spiral lamina. So this is the bony spiral lamina. So you can compare it with this edge of the uh, screw. So this is the bony spiral lamina. The membranous spiral lamella, lamella or the basilar membrane, it connects the bony spiral lamina to the lateral surface of the cochlea, dividing it into the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli. So that was the bony labyrinth. So what lies inside the bony labyrinth is the membranous labyrinth. These are the semicircular canals, the utricle into which opens all the semicircular canals, the saccule, the cochlear duct, this is the cochlear duct and this is the endolymphatic sac. So what is the endolymphatic duct and sac and what is it important? The endolymphatic duct, it arises by the union. So this is the endolymphatic duct. It arises from the union from ducts arising from the utricle and the saccule and they pass through the vestibular aqueduct to form the endolymphatic sac. So this is the utricle and the saccule. So this is the utricle, a duct from the utricle and another duct from the saccule. They join together to form the endolymphatic duct and then ultimately the sac. So the duct has three portions. It has a proximal portion it has an isthmus and it has a rugose portion and ultimately it forms the endolymphatic sac. This distilled, distilled part is flattened and lies between the dura of the posterior fossa and the petrous bone. This endolymphatic duct comes, uh, it has importance in Menius disease, we will discuss. The surgical landmark for the endolymphatic sac is a plane passing from the uh, plane passing through the lateral semicircular canal which bisects the posterior semicircular canal and contacts the posterior fossa dura. The sac lies immediately below to this plane. This line is called the Donaldson's line. And this is an important landmark for endolymphatic sac decompression. So this is how it comes the endolymphatic duct and then it expands to form the endolymphatic sac and it lies between the dura of the posterior cranial fossa and the petrous bone. The internal auditory canal, the internal auditory canal is about one centimeter in length. It runs from the CP angle to the petrous bone. The dura of the posterior cranial fossa, it continues into the internal auditory canal lining the whole length and it ends by merging with the contained nerves as they enter their respective foramina. The long axis of the canal is along the long axis of the external auditory canal. Laterally, it is closed by a thin plate of bone that is perforated by the passage of the nerves. Medially, the medial end of the internal auditory canal is called the porous and the lateral end is called the fundus. So this is the orientation of the nerves at the lateral end of the, fun, uh, the internal artery canal. This is just a mnemonic to remember, seven up and coke down. That means seventh nerve occupies the anterior superior portion. The superior vestibular nerve posterior superiorly, the cochlear nerve anterior inferiorly and the inferior vestibular nerve posterior inferiorly. So this is the fundus. So the fundus, the, the detailed description of the fundus. Now, this fundus, the bony plate separating the fundus from the middle ear and the internal ear has the transverse crest. So, this is the transverse crest, which is also called the falciform crest. Above the crest is the opening for the facial nerve. Here lies the opening of the facial nerve from which it is separated by a small vertical ridge of bone, which is called the Bill's bar from the posterior region which contains the superior vestibular nerve region. So this superior vestibular nerve, it supplies the superior and the lateral semicircular canal, the saccule and the utricle. The area below the falciform crest contains the cochlear nerve. This is the area for the cochlear nerve. And behind it has foramina for the inferior vestibular nerve which supplies the 
SACU. Below and behind the foramen is a foramen for the singular nerve which gives innervation to the posterior semicircular canal. In addition to these nerves, the internal auditory canal also contains the internal auditory artery and vein and a loop of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. The facial nerve, the important, uh, the, the location of the facial nerve in the temporal bone, the intratemporal facial nerve, it is encased in a canal which is called the fallopian canal and it has been divided into three portions. The labyrinthine portion, which is the shortest portion as it exits out of the internal artery matus and from here up till the geniculate ganglion. The labyrinthine segment, this is the labyrinthine segment, this is the labyrinthine segment. It lies between the cochlea and the superior semicircular canal. Then the tympanic segment, the tympanic segment, it starts at the first genu and it comes out at the level of the pyramid. So as soon as the geniculate ganglion, the nerve curves posteriorly at an angle of about 60 to 90 degrees. The greater superficial petrosal nerve arises from the geniculate ganglia and it emerges through the facial hiatus onto the floor of the middle cranial fossa. The tympanic segment starts at the cock superiorly and the processes cochlear formis lies just inferior to the tympanic segment. This segment measures approximately 11 millimeters and it lies below the lateral semicircular canal on the medial wall of the middle ear. This portion may be dehiscent in approximately 50% of the cases. The mastoid segment, so this is the mastoid segment, approximate length is 13 millimeters. So at the facial nerve, once it reaches the horizontal semicircular canal level, it takes a second turn or the second geno and gives a branch to the stapedius muscle and it starts descending, medial to the short process of the incus. It is traced from the second geno to the anterior end of the digastric ridge. At the level of the pyramid, the nerve turns posterior med laterally, putting the nerve at risk during the mastoid surgery. So we have to be very careful at the second geno not to injure the facial nerve during mastoidectomies. Midway in its segment, this mastoid segment, it gives off the cauda tympani nerve and the facial nerve leaves the temporal bone through the stylomastoid foramen. So in short, the landmarks for identification of the uh, facial nerve during a mastoid surgery, first of all is the cog. The cog, it points to the facial nerve in the floor So it cog points to the facial nerve in the floor of the attic. Then the cochleariform process. This is a cochleariform process lies inferior to the nerve. It is resistant to cholestitoma. The short process of incus always lies lateral to the nerve. So as long as you are lateral to the short process of incus, there is no, you are safe, you, are, you cannot injure the nerve. The lateral semicircular canal lies medial and anterior to it. The nerve lies immediately inferior to the lateral semicircular canal and above the oval window region. The digastric ridge, the nerve exits the temporal bone through the stylomastoid foramen lying anterior to the digastric ridge. So this is the percentage where the, the commonest area to be hit during mastoidectomy, it can be the tympanic segment followed by the, the second genu and the mastoid segment. So this, this was all about the temporal bone anatomy, which was relevant to the uh, temporal bone surgery. So any questions, they are most welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Sonika. Trainees, you may type your questions, comments in the chat box. Thank you. I can't see the chat box. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sonika, for uh, that uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the diagrams and the endoscopic views and the dissected uh, um, views will definitely help the candidates in their practical exams. 
because uh, you brought out the salient uh, anatomical features. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I... Yeah, I was a little yeah. late in joining, uh, got late uh, in the hospital. Okay, ma'am. Ma I just hope that uh, uh, this might help the um, uh, students because uh, the temporal bone anatomy is the basic for all the ear surgeries. And uh, I have to just um, uh, touched the important uh, clinical points, the clinical relevant anatomy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So often uh, with the videos or uh, with the uh, pictures, the images, they are uh, questioned regarding the anatomical landmarks or uh, the anatomical uh, points that we have in the middle ear, in the middle ear anatomy especially. Yes, yeah, so definitely it was helpful. Thank you, ma'am. If you can open the chat box, there are uh, uh, there is one question. Can you please share initial flu slides again? They want me to share the initial flu few slides again. Uh, Move to the next question. And the next question is different of the landmarks for facial nerve when we are going inside out and outside in. So basically landmarks for the facial nerve. On the right side, you will see a uh, balloon. Uh, the, uh, if you click over there, then you will see the chat questions. Kind of a balloon or a message box. The different landmarks for facial nerve, as uh, she just, uh, in the last uh, couple of slides, uh, she was telling about the uh, uh, facial nerve. So the landmarks are the uh, lateral semicircular canal, the sh uh, short process of uh, the incus, then uh, cog and the processus uh, cochlear formis, which are resistant to uh, cholecystoma. And then, uh, so mainly the damage site is the uh, second genu, both in the inside out approach and in the outside in approach. So when you are going inside out, I think uh, the incus would be a uh, first uh, landmark, which you can keep it in mind that the facial nerve would be uh, medial to the uh, incus. If incus is necrosed or incus is missing, then uh, then you have to be careful that uh, this one uh, landmark is uh, missing. So then uh, facial nerve would be uh, medial and uh, in, uh, anterior to the lateral semicircular canal. So if you see the bulge of the lateral semicircular canal, facial would be medial and anterior to the lateral semicircular uh, canal. Uh, so this is where the tympanic segment, where the most uh, chances of facial nerve damage are there, and also dehiscence of the facial nerve uh, canal, fallopian canal is maximum in the uh, tympanic segment. And uh, outside in also, once you open the uh, outside in, sometimes we can damage the facial nerve, uh, when we are uh, drilling towards the canal and we uh, are doing a cortical, we are doing a very good job, but uh, if you go towards the digastric uh, ridge or uh, you have gone uh, and drilled um, too medially, so you have to keep the landmark of uh, the uh, lateral semicircular canal again in mind because that would be in the medial wall of the um master yeah i had lost connection yeah yeah sorry so i was yeah, uh, answering I their question you can yeah. uh, you can uh, go again the different landmarks of facial nerve when uh, we are going inside out and outside in in mastoidectomy okay so most important uh, uh, is uh, to prevent a facial nerve injury in a mastoid surgery because it leaves a long lasting uh, complication on the face of the patient 
So uh, the uh, most important landmarks when we start with a, um, a mastoidectomy, once we start with an outside in a, a modified radical mastoidectomy, once you start drilling, the most important landmark is the lateral semicircular canal, which first comes into view. So the facial nerve will lie just below medial and inferior to it. Secondly, when you start it, the short process of the incus. So as long as you are uh, drilling lateral to the incus, the facial nerve is safe. Then in case of extensive cholestomas, another very important landmark is the processus cochlearaformis, which is a very sturdy landmark, which is supposedly never destroyed by cholestoma. So the facial nerve will lie immediately above it. Once you drill out the uh, facial uh, the ridge, when you lower the facial ridge, very important landmark is the cauda tympani nerve. Just try and preserve the cauda tympani nerve. And once you reach the cauda tympani nerve, in fact, when you are doing a mastoidectomy under local anesthesia, if you traumatize the cauda tympani nerve, the patient will, an intelligent patient will definitely tell you that there has been some taste disturbance. And that is a level till you uh, can lower the facial ridge. Then coming on inferiorly, the anterior end of the digastric ridge is the area where you can uh, again uh, be very careful because the facial nerve will exit at the stylomastoid foramen. So if we draw a line from the short process of incus to the anterior end of the digastric ridge, so that is the point for the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. So just keep in mind that line. So that line will tell you about the level of the facial descending portion or the mastoid portion of the, sec, uh, the facial nerve. This is in case we do a, uh, ma uh, uh, a canal, canal wall down mastoidectomy. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Sonika, thank, thank you. So, um, facial nerve is the great uh, leveler and uh, uh, everywhere in ENT with major surgeries, they have put a nerve over there. Yeah, so, for <laughs> ENT surgery, yeah. there is a dreaded uh, complication of a nerve. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, are there any, any more questions? I hey, think the presentation would be available on the website. So, the participants can uh, go on the website and uh, can uh, see the initial slides or the full slides over there. Okay, ma'am. Uh, there's a question for uh, wanting to know the steps of tympanoplasty, relevant anatomy, explained with pictures available. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole topic in itself. Uh, yeah, ma'am, that's a whole topic in itself. I think we can take up it um, later. Uh, maybe we, if we have a, a surgical kind of a talk where there are videos and uh, uh, and there is an unedited video or an edited video, then the uh, faculty can explain the uh, steps. Otherwise, uh, just now it would be a very long kind of a talk. Okay. I can't see any more questions, ma'am. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, how's the weather over there? Uh, ma'am, it was raining in the uh, afternoon, but it's quite humid presently. Okay, okay. Oh. So, I think the weather uh, has changed. Uh, uh, more or less, it uh, stays the same unless it snows. <laughs> yeah, no, ma'am, because it's snow in Jammu. Ma'am, I just can't see you. Yeah, I, I have not started my video. <laughs> Okay, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Good, good evening, good evening. Good evening. So, it is snow in Jammu, ma'am. It snows never. in Kashmir. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Jammu, Jammu is approximately uh, 300 kilometers away from Kashmir. So okay. it is just like any, uh, it's just like uh, Delhi. The weather is okay. just like Delhi, ma'am. Oh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's just like Delhi, ma'am. Uh, okay, there's one question. We'll take this last question. Uh, what to look up, look for in a post-op patient of tympanoplasty? Post-op examination of a tympanoplasty patient. A tympanoplasty patient. So post-operatively, uh, you mean immediate post-op? How do you uh, look for anything? Uh, any complication? 
Okay, so post-operatively, once you operate on a patient, first and foremost, you have to look for any uh, patient uh, complaint of any vertigo. Very, it is very important. Uh, tympanoplasty means that you must have done some, um, uh, it could be any, any tympanoplasty from type 1 to type uh, 3, 4. So, you have to look in uh, whether the patient has any evidence of facial nerve paresis or palsy, first of all. Secondly, uh, look uh, the, on the immediately when the patient comes out uh, of anesthesia, whether it is under uh, uh, under local G, uh, G, general anesthesia, just look in for the facial nerve paresis. Secondly, if the patient complains of vertigo, if the patient is having vertigo, that is very important because you might have uh, handled the ossicles in a uh, not very delicately. That might have less, uh, led to some inner ear trauma leading to vertigo or any ossicular processes which you might have placed is uh, pushing on the uh, inner ear or it is traumatizing the inner ear. So, that thing is to be kept in mind. And um, uh, these are two very important things which you have to look for in case you find that uh, there is a patient has a facial nerve paresis, then you might start the patient on steroids and uh, if it is an immediate paresis and if it is a palsy, it is a grade 5, if grade 4, 5 palsy, that means you have traumatized the facial nerve, you might have to give a patient a relook, open up the ear and see whether you have traumatized the facial nerve and if it is a delayed palsy, you start with steroids. Then uh, in case it is a vertigo, maybe you have to loosen the pack which is kept in the external artery canal and uh, that might also relieve his symptoms and start on anti-vertigo drugs. So, these are two very important things. If the patient is vomiting, obviously give him some um, anti-emetic or uh, because that will also give an indication the patient, the inner ear is, has been damaged. So, in such patients, steroids are of great help. So, they have to be started on steroids. These are two important things of uh, post op patients in tympanoplasty. Secondly, uh, in patients who in tympano, we have to look in for a graft uptake. So, it depends which technique of tympanoplasty you have used, whether it is a um, overlay, underlay, interlay. So, if you've done an, an underlay, which is the most common procedure, maybe you look for a graft uptake in one month. So, the graft takes up quite well. Then you have to see whether there is a um, it is a complete uptake, there is a residual perforation, the patient is having some mucolization, mucosalization of the tympanic membrane, in which case he will start have uh, discharge, persistent discharge. So, these things have to be looked in for this and there should be, uh, the external artery canal has to be kept clean. Eardrops have to be started about uh, two to three weeks following the surgery. So, to avoid a titus externa. So, these are few tips which we have to take here. Yeah, I would also, I would just like to add that uh, in the evening round when the patient is like fully conscious, uh, you should do a Weber's test uh, to look for the lateralization of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, look for the uh, Weber's, uh, especially if you have done extensive drilling in cases of uh, strepidotomy where you have uh, done for otosclerosis, uh, it becomes important that uh, you have not uh, given the patient a uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Yes. So, this uh, management and post-operative management uh, is uh, a clinical uh, topic and I think uh, definitely in your institutes when uh, you are going for the rounds or the uh, faculty is uh, teaching you, uh, definitely these points would uh, always come up in the uh, clinical round. So, uh, many things would be covered over there. Okay, uh, so, so management of temporal bone fracture. I think um, we had one session, I'm uh, not uh, remembering correctly on the temporal bone fractures, but we, uh, that's a good uh, topic. And then again, a full topic in uh, itself, uh, management of temporal bone fractures, how the patient presents, uh, what is a transverse fracture, what is a vertical fracture, what structures are more commonly affected and which type of fracture, and then the management. So, I think we've had one class, but uh, we can schedule another in the, in the future. So, Mr. Navneet, I think we will close here. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Sonika, for the presentation, and thank you very much, Professor Dr. Nilima Gupta, for joining us.
And thank you, trainees thank and you. faculty members. For thank joining. you, Dr. Sonika. I think uh, we'll again uh, uh, invite you on this uh, forum. Uh, thank you for inviting me. For future talks. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.